Uh, good morning. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Benson, who is visiting us uh, from England, but I feel like um, I should introduce myself first because I've only been here for three months and I haven't met many of you. So uh, my name is uh, Dr. Kitano and I've been in the Division of Surgical Oncology for three months and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Benson. He's a consultant breast surgeon in the, in the Cambridge Breast Unit in Cambridge United Kingdom. He obtained his medical degree from Oxford University and he received doctorate degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge Universities. He is currently the Director of Clinical Studies and Associate Lecturer at the University of Cambridge and also a Professor of Applied Surgical uh, Sciences at an Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. He is a member of numerous organizations and has published extensively in the field of breast cancer. Uh, he is one of the leaders in the treatment of breast cancer and I'm very excited to hear his talk this morning titled Breast Cancer from Radical Mastectomy to Customized Treatments. Here is Dr. Benson. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I hope you don't mind me dimming the um, lights a little bit. Um, I'd like to thank you all for the uh, very kind invitation and, and thank you for your uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm aware that um, all of you, or most of you, are uh, not uh, breast specialists. Uh, very few of you probably are, uh, but hopefully some of you have had uh, some exposure to uh, managing breast cancer patients. So uh, this morning I thought I would give a fairly broad-based uh, presentation discussing uh, several aspects of breast cancer management from the point of view of healthcare professionals uh, and also patients. And I'm going to include a variety of topics, including uh, biological paradigms in breast cancer, uh, reductionist trends in breast surgery, particularly with regard to breast conservation uh, and sentinel lymph node biopsy, um, choice of adjuvant treatments, particularly uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy, uh, the principles of clinical decision making, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, gene expression profiling and how this is creeping into uh, our management of patients and clinical decision making. And I've deliberately interwoven these themes to illustrate how patients are managed in a multidisciplinary and holistic setting. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with St. Agatha, uh, St. Agatha was, was the patron saint of breast cancer. Uh, she was famously um, tortured and had her breasts removed. Um, it's rumored that she um, rejected the advances of the Roman prefect uh, Quintianus. Uh, she also failed to renounce her Christianity. Uh, and for that reason, um, she, was, uh, she underwent uh, this uh, gruesome uh, torture. And she's now sort of recognized as the patron saint of breast cancer. So in terms of the natural history of breast cancer, the strategies for local, regional and systemic treatment of breast cancer over the past 100 years have been governed by two dominant paradigms, which I'll come on to. Uh, but it's probably true to say that there's an intermediate paradigm which is emerging, um, which is perhaps more relevant and encompasses elements of both these polar paradigms, but is less restrictive than either of these individual paradigms in pure form. And of course, you're probably aware that breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease, and it's this which presents uh, a clinical challenge to management. <laughs> And my colleague in Cambridge, Professor Carlos Keldos, um, published a paper in Nature um, about four or five years ago uh, describing 10 types uh, of breast cancer and once again emphasizing the heterogeneity of breast cancer. It's important to tailor treatments to individual patients to avoid both over-treatment and under-treatment, uh, be that with surgery, uh, radiotherapy, uh, or indeed uh, chemotherapy. So this uh, schematic sort of illustrates, do I have a pointer, by the way? Um, has anybody got a pointer? But don't worry if you haven't got one. This, 
Um, yeah, okay. So this, yeah, this schematic illustrates uh, these two uh, dominant paradigms, which are often referred to as the Holsteadian and the Fisherian paradigm. Um, and these have uh, sort of governed our understanding of the natural history of breast cancer, and in turn have gone on to sort of determine um, our base, the basic essence of management of breast cancer. So this is William Stuart Holstead, who hopefully some of you uh, will be familiar with. Um, he practiced at the Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, toward the end of the uh, 19th century, and he's often referred to as the father of breast uh, surgery. And he was the first person to really formally define a proper operation uh, for breast cancer. He was quite a colorful character, and interestingly, he was a cocaine addict. Um, and it is um, said that he sent his shirts to Paris uh, to be cleaned and starched, and the shirts came back with cocaine in the, the cuffs of the shirt. Um, so um, I, I shan't say anything more about sort of cocaine here in the United States at the moment. Um, interestingly, talking about the Holsteadian lineage, I had the honor recently um, of uh, co-authoring a paper by the uh, great, 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 great nephew um, of William Holstead, who's Charles Holstead, who did study medicine um, here in uh, Texas. Um, and we rather provocatively entitled this paper, An Historical Account of Breast Cancer Surgery, uh, Beware of Local Recurrence, but Be Not Radical. And of course, Holstead um, described the radical uh, mastectomy. So Holstead's um, hypothesis was that uh, most breast cancer was a localized disease at inception, which arises as a single focus. It spreads in a centrifugal manner, it, and it, it encroaches upon ever more distant structures. So there is this progressive and sequential spread along facial planes and lymphatics, and in particular, metastatic spread to distant organs by hematogenous dissemination was preceded by lymph node involvement. And the lymph nodes were considered to act as a kind of circumferential uh, line of defense, and they served as a barrier to further dissemination until their fil filtration capacity was exhausted. And at that point, uh, cancer cells uh, could access the circulation and, and travel to distant sites. So I have got, oh, my diagram seems to have disappeared there, but I did have a, a sort of a diagram sort of uh, illustrating that particular concept. I, I don't know where it's gone to. But Holstead's um, paradigm was based on the observation um, that local recurrence was a common antecedent to death following um, surgical excision. And the focus of local recurrence was considered uh, to be the cause or determinant of distant disease, uh, and it was temporarily related. In other words, uh, local recurrence occurred before the onset of distant uh, metastatic disease. So Holstead believed that the chance of cure was related to the extent of surgery, and he believed in the adage that uh, more is better. And, and nowadays, it's possibly true to say that um, you, know, you will often hear the term that uh, less is more. So Holstead's operation, uh, the radical mastectomy, involved an on-block resection of the tumor uh, and contiguous tissues. So the radical mastectomy then was based on this premise of the centrifugal um, theory for local regional spread of breast cancer. And it involved the on-block removal of, of the breast. And interestingly, um, at the time of Holstead's um, original description, there were no formal skin flaps created. Um, and the whole area was left to heal uh, by secondary intention following the mastectomy. Uh, the axillary lymph nodes were often removed up to level three, and together with the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor muscles, uh, that constituted the radical uh, mastectomy. And this reduced rates of local recurrence from about 60% to 6%. Um, but long-term survival was unaffected. So the radical mastectomy was good in terms of local control, but not in terms of extending uh, the life of patients. It also incurred significant disfigurement, um, and it was considered a very mutilating surgery, particularly because of removal um, of the pectoralis uh, major muscle. <clears throat> 
Uh, this shows a picture of Holstead um, in the operating theatre before he had to discontinue uh, clinical work um, on the grounds of his health. And um, so just sort of moving on away from Holstead a little bit, um, with increased awareness of breast cancer, patients were presenting with tumours which were generally less uh, locally advanced at presentation. And in particular, they were mobile on the chest wall. They weren't directly involving the pectoralis major muscle, which they were often doing uh, in the days of Holstead. So David Patey at the Middlesex Hospital, uh, he devised what is uh, referred to as the modified radical mastectomy. And this involved preservation of the pectoralis major muscle, um, but sacrifice of the pectoralis minor muscle. And it was felt that the pectoralis minor muscle had to be sacrificed in order to gain access uh, to the auxiliary, um, particularly the apical um, auxiliary nodes. So this is a patient I operated on many years ago. And you can see that she has got preservation of the um, anterior um, axillary fold. So she had a uh, modified radical mastectomy, and, and she did not want a, 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 an immediate breast reconstruction. So local regional management of breast cancer then had minimal impact on survival. And early systemic treatments did prolong survival uh, to some extent, but it was relatively recent that we had any definite evidence for any benefits of loco-regional treatments in terms of long-term survival. Um, so there was no improvement in overall survival uh, with more extensive surgery, and extensive surgery also encompassed the extended radical mastectomy in which the internal mammary nodes were removed, and also this bizarre operation called the super radical mastectomy, which was devised by Jerome Urban from New York, and, and this actually involved a four-quarter amputation. So he really carried Holstead's hypothesis to the extreme, and felt that the more tissues that were removed locoregionally, the greater was the uh, chance of cure. So thankfully, that operation uh, didn't uh, remain in fashion for very long. So this is just a, a picture of a patient with an extended radical mastectomy. And, and you could see that you know, it, it's a very ugly sort of deformity. And we rarely see this nowadays. So um, what about sort of changing the underlying sort of paradigm? Well, G um, George Crowell, he proposed that breast cancer was a sy systemic disease at a fairly early stage in its natural history. And this idea led to forays into local tumor excision. And you should appreciate at the time that this was considered a sort of surgical heresy. So anything less than a mastectomy for treatment you know, of breast cancer was very much uh, de rigueur at the time. So this tampered with tradition, but it did presage trials of breast conservation surgery. And these have now confirmed uh, that breast conservation surgery with radiotherapy yields rates of survival uh, which are comparable to a radical mastectomy or a modified uh, radical mastectomy. So uh, Bernard Fisher, who I believe is still alive, he's about 94, 95 years of age, <laughs> He proposed an alternative hypothesis to um, Holstead, and this was very much at the opposite end of the spectrum. And he believed in something called biological uh, predeterminism. And he challenged the existing paradigm, which was based on this uh, progressive centrifugal spread, um, according to anatomical, mechanical, uh, and temporal factors. And he considered that breast cancer was um, predominantly a systemic disease at the outset, which echoed the ideas of George Kral. And of course, if you think about you know, how a cancer develops when you have a, a small bolus of tumor, um, you get neovascularization, the new blood vessels, uh, endothelial cells are, are very leaky, there are gaps between them, you know, can, uh, cancer cells don't stick together very well. So, you know, breast cancer cells can enter the bloodstream at a very early stage of tumor development. And there are also lymphaticovenous uh, communications as well, uh, which can facilitate um, hematogenous dissemination. Of course, some cancer cells, which you know, are released into the circulation, are destroyed by the immune system. Um, but in breast cancer patients, many of them will form micrometastases at distant sites in accordance with the sort of seed 
urban soil um, hypothesis. So this is um, a diagram which thankfully has not completely disappeared. Um, and um, so Fisher believed that uh, cancer cells could spread from the focus in the breast um, into the bloodstream and in turn um, travel to the lungs, the bone uh, and the liver. Um, and in addition, um, you can't see this because of some corruption, um, you know, cancer cells would also spread to the lymph nodes and then in turn um, into the bloodstream. But it was this route here uh, which was the key uh, to the Fisherian uh, paradigm. So according to this paradigm, local recurrence within the conserved breast is considered a marker of risk uh, for distant relapse. And it's not a determinant of distant disease. And that's quite different uh, to Holstead's hypothesis. So it occurs against a background um, of micrometastases. Uh, and it's the presence of micrometastases at the time of presentation uh, which determines a patient's clinical fate and their overall survival. And the extent of loco-regional treatment, be that mastectomy or breast conservation therapy, has limited impact on overall survival. So in a sense, the horse has already bolted uh, from the stable. And we know now that at least 50% of patients presenting with what is ostensibly early stage breast cancer will have uh, micrometastases. And it's these micrometastases um, which we have to deal with um, using systemic treatments, including hormonal therapy, uh, chemotherapy, uh, and biological therapies. So clinical trials by Fisher and others have confirmed uh, that mastectomy and breast conservation therapy are equivalent in terms of overall survival, and longer-term follow-up data is now available from several uh, prospective randomized controlled trials uh, demonstrating equivalence of survival for breast conservation therapy uh, compared uh, with mastectomy. Um, and an update of the uh, BO6 trial uh, with 20-year follow-up uh, shows that the curves are parallel for disease-free survival, distant disease-free survival, uh, and overall survival. And in particular, um, rates of local recurrence are much higher uh, for patients having just lumpectomy uh, without radiotherapy. Uh, this is a, a sort of forest plot of these important trials, and if you exclude the NSABP trial, which is quite a large trial, the, the odds ratio is about unity, and if you include uh, the NSABP trial, it falls just to the right, but it's not statistically significant, um, suggesting that breast uh, conservation therapy may be slightly uh, better. Now, interestingly, recently there was um, an intriguing um, population-based observational study um, which um, compared uh, mastectomy and breast conservation surgery um, in terms of disease-free and overall survival. And this was carried out by Marissa van Maren uh, from the Dutch um, Cancer Institute. And they looked at a primary cohort of almost 40,000 patients uh, treated between 2000 and 2004. And these were analyzed uh, for 10-year um, overall survival. Um, all patients had early stage disease, T1 to 2 and 0 N1. And about 60% of patients underwent breast conservation surgery um, and had breast radiotherapy. And these tended to be younger patients with smaller, um, well-differentiated um, tumors. And this study did show that there was a statistically significant overall survival advantage for breast conservation uh, compared with mastectomy with a hazard ratio of about 0.81. And the median follow-up was 11.3 years. And these results uh, were irrespective of the uh, tumor stage. So they were observed for both N0 and N1 um, disease. Now, needless to say, um, this was, you know, quite a controversial uh, paper. It was actually presented here in San Antonio um, uh, sort of um, a couple of years ago. But the interpretation of this study, remember it is an observational study, is quite limited by selection bias and unmeasured uh, confounding factors, which may influence, you know, the choice of patients undergoing uh, conservation or mastectomy, um, and those same factors may also have a direct effect uh, on overall survival. 
So although that study did reassure us that breast conservation surgery is, is quite safe and certainly is the optimum uh, choice of surgical treatment for the majority of patients, I think it's wrong to, um, for patients to be led to believe that having breast conservation surgery will necessarily uh, prolong their life. So as always, we have to give um, informed um, consent uh, to our patients nowadays. So with smaller um, tumor size at presentation, the majority of women nowadays are eligible uh, for conventional techniques of breast conservation surgery uh, together with radiotherapy. But despite suitability for breast conservation therapy, uh, mastectomy rates remain quite variable both here uh, and also in Europe. And the current rates of mastectomy are about 40 to 45 uh, percent. And this variation in rates of mastectomy to some extent reflects differences in philosophy and education amongst surgeons. Um, it, it reflects a fear and concern um, amongst patients about cancer coming back. And about a third of patients who are um, um, suitable for conventional breast conservation surgery will opt uh, for a mastectomy. And in fact, those patients um, tend to be the ones that have fully informed consent and have been given information on rates of local recurrence and, and that sort of information. So there is a problem with ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence for patients having breast conservation. Um, rates of local recurrence have decreased quite dramatically in recent years. They're currently about 3.5 to 6.5 percent at 10 years. But for estrogen receptor positive patients, the rates of recurrence do persist out to 15 uh, or 20 years. Now, despite great variation in rates of local recurrence within individual trials of breast conservation therapy, this doesn't translate into survival differences for individual trials. And this led Fisher to conclude that there was no causal relationship between local recurrence within the conserved breast uh, and distant disease. So local recurrence was an indicator of risk uh, for distant metastases. And of course, it's an important principle for patients to understand about the long-term outcome and their overall survival in the equivalence between breast conservation uh, and mastectomy. And of course, breast conservation trials uh, would never have been um, able to be conducted if there was any suggestion at all of compromise in overall survival from undergoing something less than a mastectomy for treatment of breast cancer. So this just illustrates how uh, variations in local treatment within the trials, whether that's uh, lumpectomy, lumpectomy and radiotherapy or mastectomy, um, is not reflected in any differences in distant uh, disease-free survival. So um, according to the Fisherian paradigm then, uh, local recurrence is a marker of risk for distant relapse against a background of micrometastases. And it really reflects a host tumor relationship which favors development of distant disease and activation of processes which are poorly understood, which lead to kickstart of these micrometastases, sometimes many years or even decades after the original diagnosis. Now, I've talked a lot about, uh, you know, breast cancer as a systemic disease, but we do now have information from an important meta-analysis undertaken in 2005, which compared local regional treatments. And it was found that where treatment comparisons, for example, wide local excision versus wide local excision and radiotherapy, where those differences in local recurrence were more than 10%, there were moderate reductions in overall survival, and that was both breast cancer specific and um, overall survival. And this kind of accords with the intuitive assumption that viable cancer cells remaining in peritumoral tissue following a lumpectomy can proliferate um, and metastasize to distant sites. And, and that kind of, you know, accords with a kind of Holstedian thought process. So inadequate local regional treatment may ultimately compromise longer term survival. 
So this meta-analysis by the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group has reinforced the link between local control and, and mortality. And nowadays, there is greater emphasis on the adequacy of surgical excision uh, and also other treatment-related variables, such as radiotherapy. So although overall survival uh, may not be compromised um, by um, uh, you know, the type of local regional treatment, there is a major psychological impact of local recurrence. And often when patients develop uh, recurrence of breast cancer, they think you know, that they're going to die uh, and the prognosis is very bad. And, and often it's much more traumatic psychologically than the original disclosure of the primary breast cancer diagnosis. So selection of patients for breast conservation is of crucial importance. And there's generally an inverse relationship uh, between the need for surgical uh, radicality on the one hand uh, and cosmesis on the other. And the biology of the disease is also very important. And, and this picture here um, illustrates a patient who initially had breast conserving surgery. She subsequently developed in breast recurrence. She had a mastectomy and reconstruction. She went on to get chest wall recurrence and then had to have the mastectomy, uh, you know, the, uh, the reconstruction taken down. And she had this salvage um, LD flap. And she subsequently developed further recurrence and, and succumbed uh, from her disease. So so biology is, is very important. Now, I think here in the United States, it's true to say that, you know, oncoplastic breast surgery, you know, is starting, you know, to take hold. And these newer techniques present quite exciting opportunities for conserving the breast while satisfying important oncological mandates. However, there's no clear evidence at the present time uh, that excision of tumours with a very wide surgical margin is associated with lower rates um, of in-breast recurrence. Um, more extensive oncoplastic resections do certainly reduce the chance of having a positive margin, and they do reduce rates of re-excision uh, following breast conservation. So often these patients in the UK will, will definitely get an MRI um, prior to um, this sort of more major oncoplastic surgery. I'm aware in the United States, probably anybody undergoing breast conservation surgery uh, will get an MRI. Uh, this is a patient who, you know, who had a primary tumor diagnosed here. Uh, she had an MRI uh, which showed an additional lesion which turned out um, to be a fibroadenoma. Um, often these uh, patients have to undergo a further the core biopsy, um, and that can delay surgery. So MRI sometimes detects further disease, uh, which has to be acted upon, and, and, and that can ultimately uh, delay surgery. So this picture here sort of encompasses the concept of um, oncoplastic surgery. So if you have a tumour in the territory of a reduction mammoplasty, it's possible to perform your wide local excision essentially as part of a reduction uh, mammoplasty, and hence the term uh, therapeutic mammoplasty. So this is one example of, of oncoplastic surgery. And it's quite big surgery because, you know, these patients have to undergo uh, contralateral breast surgery as well. And ideally, these sort of techniques are suited to patients who have relatively large uh, breasts. So I'm going to move on to uh, management of the axilla, which is an integral part uh, of breast cancer management and has really undergone some fairly uh, fundamental changes in recent years. So surgical techniques have progressively become uh, less extensive, uh, both with, with respect to uh, you know, the parenchymal breast resection and also nodal resection. And much of the morbidity from breast surgery derives from interventions to remove the auxiliary lymph nodes. And typically, uh, lymphedema rates vary from about 10 to 30 percent with a level 2, 3 auxiliary lymph node dissection. But they can increase to 50 percent uh, at 20 years. And of course, although we're doing the sentinel node biopsy now, um, patients are surviving longer uh, following breast cancer treatment. So there will be a greater prevalence of lymphedema um, because of improved survivorship, even though we're not doing as many auxiliary uh, dissections. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy is a targeted form of sampling. It's now widely practiced and accepted as standard of care for breast cancer patients. It's a safe and accurate method for uh, staging the axilla. And in particular, it's associated with reduced upper limb morbidity, particularly uh, lymphedema. But it should be noted that some people have reported uh, rates of lymphedema of up to 8% with sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, ideally, dual localization techniques should be used uh, using blue dye and radioisotope. These will shorten the learning curve and they optimize uh, performance indicators such as identification rates, false negative rates. <coughs> The B32 trial um, was published uh, back in 2010. This involved more than 5,000 patients who underwent sentinel lymph node biopsy with auxiliary lymph node dissection or sentinel lymph node biopsy alone. And the bottom line here is that there is no significant difference in overall survival, disease-free survival, um, or regional control at a follow-up of about uh, six months, 96 months. So it was on the basis of this trial um, that sentinel lymph node biopsy for early stage clinically node negative patients was deemed to be a safe, uh, appropriate, and effective um, therapy. So this is a picture of um, a sent uh, sentinel node. So these are two uh, blue and hot nodes. Uh, this is a little bit of fat. And um, in the UK, we are using fluorescence as one of the newer traces for identifying the sentinel node. Uh, though I believe this has been uh, used um, uh, limit to a limited extent in the United States. It's very popular in Japan. Um, and these are, are intensely fluorescent nodes, which, which correspond to the blue uh, and the hot nodes in that particular slide. And a little bit of fat, you know, doesn't show up uh, as fluorescent. So just moving on to this important trial, the Z11 trial, which was um, um, commented on in the New York Times a few years ago. Uh, this important trial randomized almost 900 sentinel lymph node biopsy positive patients to either a completion auxiliary lymph node dissection or observation uh, alone. And there was no difference in rates of local regional recurrence or overall survival uh, between the two arms at a follow-up of about six years. But the trial did fail to accrue as many patients had as had originally been planned because the event rate was much lower than anticipated. And this trial has had significant implications um, and indeed has been practice changing, you know, particularly on the um, sort of east and western coast of the United States and in parts of continental Europe, perhaps not quite so much in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and this is partly because, you know, surgeons believe if there's any suggestion of cancer within lymph nodes, those nodes need to be surgically extirpated. And it's more difficult for surgeons to believe that residual cancer in non-sentinel lymph nodes can be ablated uh, with non-surgical treatments such as radiotherapy and systemic treatments. So the Z11 trial you know, confirmed that these, the two arms of the trial were equivalent uh, in terms of um, overall survival and disease-free survival. Um, the rates of regional recurrence in the initial analysis uh, were 0.9% for the sentinel lymph node biopsy alone arm, arm and 0.5% for the completion auxiliary dissection arm, which are very sort of uh, acceptable rates of regional recurrence. And about a quarter of patients who had an auxiliary dissection did have disease in non-sentinel lymph nodes, but the rate of auxiliary recurrence was very low despite this. And there is now longer-term follow-up, which has recently been published by Giuliani, uh, a mean of 9.25 years of follow-up. Um, and this upholds the original results of the study. Um, and there's still no significant difference uh, between the two arms. So the rates of regional recurrence are 1.5% for the sentinel node biopsy alone arm and um, still 0.5% for the auxiliary dissection arm. And the median time to recurrence was 48 uh, months. So auxiliary recurrences tend to occur early. So there's no reason to believe that even with further follow-up of this trial, the overall uh, conclusions will be um, over turned. So patients in Z11 generally did have a low burden um, of auxiliary disease with few patients likely to have more than two nodes positive. But it does show that sentinel node biopsy 
basically has a therapeutic value similar to axillary lymph node dissection for many patients. Adjuvant treatments may compensate for under-treatment of the axilla, and it's now acknowledged that up to 50% of patients within Z11 did have high tangent fields, and indeed 15% had supraclavicular uh, fossa irradiation. And systemic treatments also reduce uh, rates of loco-regional uh, recurrence. Um, we know from the BO4 trial many years ago that there was no survival um, advantage from axillary lymph node dissection, um, but Z11 is very different to that trial, and tumors now are much smaller at presentation. They have a lower nodal burden. Um, knowledge of absolute numbers of positive nodes is less important, and as I said, uh, we, we now acknowledge that chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and, and Herceptin um, can promote uh, local regional control. Uh, this just illustrates here the, the, the sort of high tangents uh, which were given to many patients in, uh, in Z11. So the beam comes to within about two centimeters of, of, of the humerus. But I'm not a radiotherapist. Um, so in the UK, you know, we tend to be a little bit skeptical in the, in the UK, a little bit more cynical. And um, we're now carrying out a kind of UK version of Z11 called the POSNOC trial. And this is a non-inferiority trial which is aiming to recruit uh, about 1,900 patients from 50 centres uh, in the UK uh, and Australia. It originally aimed to recruit over a two and a half year period, um, but it's going to take a little bit longer than that. Uh, the recruitment was 500 um, as of um, October 2016, and that was after about two and a half years. And, and the inclusion criteria are similar uh, to Z11, but it does include mastectomy patients who may not, of course, receive radiotherapy of any kind. And it will only include patients with one or two uh, macro metastases in the sentinel node. So I think we're all agreed now that patients with micro metastases, uh, less than two millimeters, do not require any form of further auxiliary uh, surgery. So this shows the uh, schematic for the uh, POSNOC trial. So all patients will have an auxiliary ultrasound uh, and possibly core biopsy FNA. And if they're node positive, they will get a clearance. If they're node negative, they may have uh, breast conservation or mastectomy and sentinel lymph node biopsy. If they've got one or two nodes positive with macro metastases, then they can be randomized to either no auxiliary treatment or further auxiliary treatment, which might include auxiliary uh, radiotherapy uh, and not just uh, a completion dissection and then they'll be appropriately followed up uh, for five years. So this is a diagram which has been taken from a recent paper I published with uh, uh, Dr. Jatoi uh, and a colleague from Japan, which, which sort of illustrates uh, this sort of de-escalation of auxiliary surgery in the past, um, you know, sort of 20, 25 years or so, going from a level three auxiliary dissection to level two, and then auxiliary sampling, um, to, to targeted sampling with sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, and then eventually, we may not necessarily need to do any auxiliary staging in some patients. And there is a trial um, currently being undertaken in Italy exploring the possibility of omitting any form of auxiliary surgery in low-risk uh, patients. But I, I don't want to go into further details of that at the moment. I'd like to move on now to something about clinical uh, decision-making and the clinical decision-making process, which I think is quite challenging for breast cancer patients. So clearly information is an antecedent to decision-making and it should be evidence-based. Most patients wish uh, to participate in the decision-making process. A few of them prefer a sort of paternalistic approach, but they haven't relinquished their information needs. Patient preferences and the desired level of participation in shared decision-making has to be carefully judged, um, and it has to be based uh, individually, uh, and you should always respect a uh, patient's point of view. And patients... Um, you know, viewpoint and their need for information are not necessarily static and they can change uh, with increasing time uh, from the point of um, diagnosis. So I apologize for the quality of this slide, but this just illustrates the sort of key decision points for patients um, with an early, um, uh, with a diagnosis of early stage breast cancer. So first of all, we have to decide whether they're having primary surgery uh, or primary chemotherapy. 
If they're having primary surgery, is that going to be conservation or mastectomy? If they have a mastectomy, are they going to have no reconstruction, immediate reconstruction, um, or a delayed reconstruction? Are they then go, going to go on and have chest wall uh, radiotherapy? If they have breast conservation, uh, they may go straight on to radiotherapy of the breast. They may have a re-excision, may have to have a mastectomy. And then again, we've got decisions on um, reconstruction. If they go along the primary chemotherapy route, uh, there are issues about the timing of sentinel lymph node biopsy. And then, of course, whether they should have breast conservation surgery after chemotherapy or mastectomy. And that can be a very difficult decision because we can't always tell whether a tumor shrinks in a concentric manner or whether it shrinks in a, or whether it doesn't really shrink. It, it ends up like a sort of Swiss cheese effect. And the actual footprint of the tumor has changed very little, even though the tumor bulk may have decreased quite dramatically. And often those patients will still need to have a mastectomy. So, um, yes, I apologise, there's a little bit of corruption of some of my slides. So, um, several management choices um, have to be made uh, for patients, and um, the timing of auxiliary surgery um, is an important one, and in the UK, about half of patients get uh, a sentinel lymph node biopsy ahead of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but we're now moving towards doing sentinel lymph node biopsy um, following chemotherapy, which saves uh, an additional operation. Um, this here shows a patient who's had an auxiliary ultrasound showing a thickened cortex, uh, and this node uh, did contain uh, tumor cells. Uh, this is a patient who um, had an auxiliary uh, dissection after sentinel lymph node biopsy, uh, which can be a particularly challenging technique. Um, the axilla is very unforgiving from a surgical point of view, and even after just two or three weeks, um, there can be significant fibrosis within the axilla, uh, which can make it very difficult to separate tissues safely from the um, axillary vein. And if you've had chemotherapy as well, it can be particularly difficult. So, um, Breast conservation versus mastectomy, well, if we're talking about, you know, the sort of conventional uh, breast conservation surgery, women who have a small unifocal non-high-grade lesion, which is situated away from the nipple, we would normally recommend um, conventional breast conservation surgery, and we would tend to steer patients um, toward that. And, and often we don't discuss mastectomy in those situations unless the patient herself raises it. <coughs> For patients with larger, slightly higher grade tumours, uh, there is a risk of um, in-breast recurrence, uh, and the tumour may be borderline uh, for conservation from a technical point of view. I mean, often we don't have true surgical equipoise, um, and surgeons tend to favour breast conservation um, or mastectomy, but we should always try to avoid over and under treatment um, of patients. Um, this is somebody who's had breast conservation. These are just pen marks, they're not suture marks. Uh, this patient had quite a large tumour situated near the nipple areola complex, but she did undergo successful breast conservation. She didn't need to have any, um, you know, complex oncoplastic surgery, um, and she got a good cosmetic result. And the scar actually was made directly overlying the tumour, not as a periareolar incision, uh, for which there is an increasing trend um, at the present time. Now, some patients wish to minimise their risk of local recurrence, and they do opt for mastectomy. And you may be aware of this um, movement towards maximal surgery, which is very evident in the United States, in which patients who have a small unifocal tumour may opt not just for unilateral mastectomy and reconstruction, but also a contralateral prophylactic uh, mastectomy as well. And rates of contralateral prophylactic mastectomy have increased about 150% um, in the past 10 years, and, and there's still a continuing demand uh, for this type of procedure, which is perhaps ironic in the era of um, sort of uh, breast conservation. For younger patients, it should be remembered that there's not only a risk of in-breast recurrence of the original tumour, but also a risk of a de novo cancer within the conserved breast. Also, if there's a positive family history, this may also modulate the decision um, for a mastectomy. And clearly, if there's any genetic predisposition, 
predisposition patients are likely uh, to have bilateral uh, reconstruction. Also, older patients tend to um, sometimes favor a mastectomy because they don't want to go through uh, radiotherapy or they only want one operation. If they've got significant comorbidities, it's better to, to, to carry out a single operation. This is a relatively young patient who had actually had bilateral cancers and she didn't want any form of reconstruction at all. And she was, a friend called her her flatmate. So um, what about primary surgery versus primary um, chemotherapy? Well, clinical trials have failed to show any overall survival advantage for neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, compared to adjuvant um, chemotherapy. And it sometimes can be difficult to sell uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy to patients. Um, patients often are entered into um, trials of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and they have to contend with issues such as uncertainty um, and, and equipoise, and patients often want the best form of treatment uh, which is available at the time. And it can be very difficult for them to decide whether to enroll in clinical trials or not. And they're often